This program presents the evidence-based practices described in preventing aspiration in older adults with dysphagia. It is estimated that between 300,000 to 600,000 individuals in the U.S. are affected with dysphagia, resulting largely from neurological disorders. As the population ages, the prevalence of this problem will most likely increase. This program describes steps nurses can take in oral and tube feeding of patients with dysphagia to minimize the risk of aspiration. Um, Annie Heather today had May as her patient that she followed. So can you tell us a little bit about May? Yes. Um, May is 81 years old. She was admitted four days ago with weakness and altered mentation. Uh, she was lethargic. She stopped eating, drinking, taking her medications uh, for two days. And her lithium level was 2.3. So she had a mild toxic case of lithium mm -hmm. toxicity. Mm -hmm. Good morning, May. I'm Annie. I'm going to be taking care of you again today. Okay, you know, the nursing students are back with us. My name's Dottie. Hi, Dottie. It's nice to meet you. And I'm Heather. Yeah. Yeah. Heather. First thing you need to remember is that when you, when you go to eat, you need to be sitting all the way up. So we try to sit them up as far as, we, as their orders possibly allow them to be. There was a study published last year by Snell, uh, Simmons and Snell in um, JAGS that said it takes 35-40 minutes to feed a patient who's having swallowing problems or who's frail and just slower at eating. Whoever's doing the feeding, they need training and proper feeding technique. It's important to recognize that feeding's complicated. There's a lot of factors that go into uh, feeding the older adult, the older adult in particular who's at risk of aspirating. So supervision of the nurse assistant, training of the nurse assistant, and um, just observation of what's going on with the patient and how they're doing during mealtime. Best case scenario would be if they were in a chair. Um, sometimes people prefer not to be, it tires them out too much. You want them to get as much rest as possible before they're going to eat because they're using a lot of muscles to swallow. Okay, you ready? Yes. Okay, we're going to use small bites. Probably would be best if you alternate liquids with solids keeps them from pocketing food and they have less chance of swallowing the food down into their respiratory tract. Annie, what kind of symptoms might I see if a patient's having a hard time swallowing? Okay, well, they can have some choking after taking a bite of solid food. Um, there's some gurgling after taking a sip of liquid and sometimes they can even have voice changes after taking a bite of food if they're choking on it. And what would you do if they still were having problems swallowing, if they were choking or...? Well, there's a few things you can do. First of all, you can stop feeding, obviously. Call the doctor, uh, let them know that you think that they might be choking, getting something where it's not supposed to be. Sometimes when they're having trouble swallowing, you can instruct them to do the chin down maneuver, which is where uh, when they swallow, you instruct them to put their chin down to their chest and swallow that way. Uh, it helps to promote easier access into the stomach. Uh, sometimes it, you can even stroke their esophagus or their throat and it helps them to cue them to swallow better. Now what if a patient's just clearing their throat or grunting a little bit while, you're, while they're eating? Sometimes that can be uh, when the patient is taking a drink of fluid and it ends up coming down into the trachea. Uh, they're trying to clear it out, trying to get it out of there. I would also report that, let the doctors know, get a speech therapy evaluation, see if there's anything that they can do because that can lead to silent aspiration. When the patient's done eating, you always want to check their mouths, make sure that they're not by any chance pocketing any food because that can get caught and later go down into their lungs. Um, so you want to put on a pair of gloves. May, can I take a look in your mouth? Can you open up for me? We'll see if you got anything in there. Always check their cheeks. Make sure there's nothing stuck in there. You want to lift your tongue up? Let me see under there. Good job. Okay, it looks like everything's down. Um, you always want to provide the, your patients with good oral hygiene. Make sure that their teeth are brushed, um, that they do, that they get their teeth brushed, and that they uh, rinse with mouthwash at least twice a day, always after meals also, if you can get them to do it. Um, now check and make sure that their dentures are fitting correctly so that they're not loose and moving around. That can also... Um, cause problems. All right, May, are you done eating? 
Yes, and it doesn't happen. Okay. Then we're going to get your tray out of the way and do some oral care for you, okay? Okay. All right. First, we're going to brush your teeth to get rid of the food particles. Okay. Feel like you can do this on your own, May? I think so. Okay. We're going to help you. Let me get some toothpaste on this for you. Okay. Go ahead and brush your teeth. And if they would need any help, you can assist them to brush the back of their teeth and on the inside, lower front, and the back. Sometimes it helps to talk with them, keep them more alert, more awake while they're brushing their teeth, make sure they get everything. You doing okay, May? Yeah? You feel like you're almost done? You want to rinse? Okay. First we're going to rinse with water. And take a sip. Yeah. You can lean forward and spit it out in here, okay? Have them rinse with mouthwash. Feel like you got it all? Yeah. Okay, now we're going to rinse with your mouthwash. Rid of everything? Yes. Okay. Can we check your mouth again? Let's look in there. Much better. Okay. So, Annie, can you tell us a little bit of um, Mrs. Tilson's history? Yes. Um, she's 82 years old. She came into us 14 days ago with ulcer and dehydration. She has a history of diabetes, CHF, anemia, and dementia. Uh, while she was at home, she was under hospice care. While she was here, she developed AFib, needed to be cardioverted, and sent to the unit where she was intubated. Um, then she developed right lower lobe pneumonia. Her tube feeding was placed four days ago and was confirmed by x-ray. About three days ago, um, the doctors asked us to come in. Um, because she had suddenly um, developed an inability to swallow, or some difficulty swallowing. Um, and when we got there, um, we basically did our um, bedside evaluation, which consists of um, doing a full chart review and getting a, a good understanding of the history, and then just meeting the patient and seeing um, what she's currently doing at bedside. We look at um, strength and range of motion of her oral muscles, um, and check and see if she's um, spontaneously swallowing um, her saliva, which at that point she was not. Um, we provided a little bit of oral care to her, and she did have a reaction. She did, you know, put her lips around the swab and kind of responded to it. Um, so we presented a, a bolus of pudding to her, and she held it in her mouth for about 20, 25 seconds, and then spit it back out. Um, and the nurses said that that's what she had been doing for the last, well, about 24 hours, is that they hadn't been able to get her to actually swallow anything. Um, and uh, so what we're doing now is um, going in and doing some stimulation therapy with her and seeing if we can't get her to, you know, accept it and actually swallow um, the, the bolus of food. So and at this point, it was more appropriate for her to go ahead and um, get some tube feeding so that she can meet her nutritional needs and they can get the medicine in her that she needs. I'm Annie. I'm going to be taking care of you today. We have two nursing students. Let them introduce themselves. Good morning. I'm Heather. Uh -oh. Hi, I'm Dottie, Miss Tilson. Mrs. Tilson was just admitted to the hospital with pneumonia. Um, she also had a small board 
tube feeding place, so we want to be particularly attentive to that so that she doesn't develop aspiration. Patients who are on tube feeding, they need to be closely monitored. Um, there's been research that looks that um, uh, pa patients who are on two feedings really need um, careful assessment, positioning of the tube, has the position changed, checking the residuals, checking toleration of the feeding. And that needs to be done by a nurse who's trained in those procedures. Patients that have small bore feeding tubes, you always want to make sure that they're at least 30 degrees in the bed, if not a little bit higher for comfort. Once the tube is placed, you want to make sure that you tape it, and then you want to make sure that you mark it so that you know how far it is out of the stomach. Okay, and you just take a tape measure and a black marker, and you measure from the tip of the nose to the end of the tube, which is right here. These are just little ports for feeding. All right, Mrs. Tillerson, we're going to measure how far the tube extends from your nose, okay? Okay. Um, a couple ways to check placement throughout your shift are to check and make sure that you see where the mark is at and check and make sure that you can measure from the beginning to the end of the tube and then also to check pH. Hi Mrs. Tilson, I'm Jan. I'm going to be helping Nanny for a few minutes, okay? Okay. Okay. Now we're just going to check residual. Again, you want to make sure that they're elevated more than 30 degrees, and if they have a tube feeding running, make sure that it is off. I'm going to inject 30 cc's of air. And you're using a 60 cc syringe, right? Yes. Okay, Mrs. Tilson, I'm just going to check and make sure that your tube's in the right spot. Make sure that you clamp between the patient and the port that you're going to open. Make sure that's in there firmly. Hold on tight to that. Clamp between the port and yourself and inject air. Then you want to pull back 30 cc's to check the gastric residual. And pull back as much as you can actually. So if you can't get anything back, then you can inject another 30 cc's of air. One more time, Mrs. Tilson. And how much residual is too much? Um, anything, well, it depends on what the doctor has written for the patient. In her case, it's 60 cc's. So it looks like it. Go ahead and keep that out, any of the residual that you have. Go ahead and collect that. And we'll use that to measure the pH. You always want to look and examine the contents of the fluid. If it's a tan color like this, it looks a lot like just regular tube feeding that has not been inserted yet. Um, that's good. Uh, and then you want to measure it. So we have about two cc's here. And then we're going to check the pH before we insert it back into the patient. And now I'm going to show you how to check the pH, which is another way to tell whether where the tube is placed. So I take uh, a pH strip, and you can only, I would read the instructions because it may have a varying amount depending on the brand of strips that your institution has, but as far as how long you would leave the formula on there. And then you just want to put a couple of drops, we don't have very much here to check with, but I'm going to put a couple of drops of formula on the pH strip, and then you want to wait for 30 seconds with this brand of strips. So I take the stick and I line it up with the squares and I try to see which line it matches closest with. So Donnie, what would you think? Where do you think it falls? 
That's right about a six or a seven. Okay. So, right. Okay. Heather and Annie, where do you think it? What line do you think it most closely matches up to? About a six. Okay. So that would tell us where the likely placement of the tube is. So Mrs. Um, Tilson's tube is placed in her duodenum, confirmed by X-ray. And so this, if it was, if it's greater than five. That means that it's unlikely to be in the gastric, that it's unlikely to have moved up into the stomach area, and that it's probably maintained its position in the lower intestine. Why would it be a problem if it moved into her stomach? That would tell us that there's a possibility that the tube has actually moved up from where it was originally placed. And um, there's some indication that the tubes that are placed lower in, in for example, the duodenum, are, people are less likely to aspirate. Now that we've confirmed placement, we're just going to flush the tube to make sure that there's no clogs when you turn the tube feeding back on. Okay. okay. So now we've checked, made sure that the markings are correct and the length was correct. We checked residual. Um, we checked the pH of the tube or of the gastric residual. Now we're just gonna take a look at her since she's a little bit lethargic and make sure that there are no signs of her having any vomiting or any regurgitation in her mouth. You also want to check their abdomen and make sure that she's not distended. And that would be a sign that she's not tolerating in the tube feeding. Mrs. Tilson, we're just gonna take a look at your abdomen here for a second. First, you would take a listen to her stomach. Make sure she's got good bowel sounds. Okay. All right. She's got good bowel sounds. You want to check in all four quadrants. And I always look, um, patients with tubings are at risk of regurgitating and vomiting and aspirating. Um, some, the risk may be the same or greater for patients who are on tube feeding than for patients who are being hand fed. So I also, she's lethargic and she can't really tell us if she's vomited or anything. So when I have a patient like that, in addition to doing all of these steps, I look at their pillow to make sure there's no signs of any regurgitated um, uh, tube feeding or any other problems. So her pillow's all nice and, um, you know, there's no um, tubing or anything on her gown. So she seems to be re resting comfortably. So that's a good sign. That's another thing when I'm checking. I just look in her mouth to just see if there's any signs of tube feeding in her mouth. And she's got her mouth open. And this is Tilson. I don't see any um, tube feeding in your mouth, so that's a good sign. All right. Now that we've checked placement, um, checked her belly to make sure she was tolerating the tube feeding, that there were no problems, checked her pH, we're going to do the oral care. So we're going to use these swabs and water with a little bit of mouthwash in it and swab out her mouth. Now since she is lethargic, you want to be very careful how much water is in the swab. You don't want her to aspirate on the oral care solution. Okay, so you want to squeeze out as much water as you can. And when you're finished, put a little bit of lubrication on their lips so that their mouth doesn't get too dried out. And put this on your lips, Mrs. Tilson. The biggest problem with dysphagia in my mind is uh, the rate of aspiration and the uh, bad consequences of aspiration. And I think it might be helpful to review what happens when a person with dysphagia has a swallowing problem. But essentially what happens, definition of aspiration is a foreign substance entering the airway.
And with a dysphagic patient, it's almost always because of failure of the epiglottis to close to keep the food or fluid from entering the trachea instead of the esophagus. So what we wind up with then is someone who either aspirates food or uh, liquids, which is what we're primarily interested in today, I think, with dysphagic patients, is how we feed them. But I think we also need to consider what I see in my practice very often is patients aspirate oral pharyngeal secretions. Uh, with tube-fed patients, they regurgitate gastric contents, and then we either see a chemical pneumonitis, for example, like from a gastric juice that has a low pH, it irritates the lung, they get a pneumonitis. If it gets a superimposed pathogen involved, then we get pneumonia, mm. aspiration pneumonia, which is very prevalent in uh, elderly dysphagic patients. Pneumonia is the eighth leading cause of death um, of older adults in the United States. That was a, the 2004 statistic. And about 30% of um, cases of pneumonia um, are believed to be aspiration pneumonia. So it does occur at a very high frequency. And I read a recent article that even goes beyond the 30 percent. Out of 170 patients admitted to an acute care facility from a nursing home, uh, they could trace 75 percent of the uh, pneumonias back to an aspiration event, which I think is very wow. telling. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason we have to strive to prevent aspiration from occurring whenever we can. And I know you've done a lot of work with tube feeding and the prevention of aspiration. Um, Yes. Can you talk about that? When a feeding tube is blindly inserted, and that merely means that the individual that's placing the tube either inserts the tube through the nose or through the mouth, and they can't see where the tube is going, so we call that a blind insertion. Mm -hmm. With a blind insertion, it's very probable that a tube can take the wrong course rather than going into the esophagus, going into the trachea. And I've seen a number of patients where the tube wasn't checked properly by an x-ray and formula was indeed administered into the lung. And we call that aspiration by proxy. And uh, it's caused death. It can certainly cause uh, serious illness if it doesn't cause death. So we want to prevent a tube from going into the lung. But I think we also need to consider that a tube goes in the right spot in the GI tract. And I've seen several cases in the past year where a feeding tube gets into the esophagus but doesn't get beyond the esophagus. Mm -hmm. And then the ports are there in the esophagus, and when they dump the formula in, then here's formula flowing into the esophagus. Part of it refluxes back into the mouth and the individual aspirates. So it can be very serious. So the bottom line is with a blindly placed feeding tube, we have to have radiographic confirmation that the tube is in the right place. The right place can either be the stomach, if that's the desired site, or it can be the small bowel. And in critical care settings, we feed most people in the small bowel, but uh, sometimes in the stomach. But the important thing is to rule out the esophagus and the lung. So that's the first thing. Then checking placement after the tube feeding has been started is a big factor. When a feeding tube is initially placed, the standard of care across the U.S. is getting a radiograph an x-ray to show that it's correctly positioned. And the radiograph that's needed is an abdominal radiograph rather than a chest film. And the reason is, in adults, the chest film doesn't go down low enough to tell where the tube's positioned. It can tell you it's not in the lung, but it can't tell you whether it's in the right part of the stomach or in the, a small bowel where we want it. So the x-ray at initial placement, I think, is mandatory. I've seen too many patients get into trouble when that wasn't done and really in a court of law that you're held to that standard. Now, after a feeding is started, you can't keep getting x-rays to see if it stayed in the right position. So what I like to do is when the radiograph is initially done, mark the tube where it enters the nose or the mouth, and then watch it to see if it moves more than a couple inches. Then also checking residual volumes. When I do that, I look at what the aspirate looks like from the tube. Uh, does it look like formula that's unchanged? Does it look like curdled formula? And if the formula is going into the stomach, it's hitting an acidic pH and it gets this curdled appearance very often. Not always, but very often. If the feeding's in the small bowel, pretty often the formula has a bile staining to it. So those are things that we use. Uh, it, it's not always foolproof, but it's one of the indicators. Then lastly, the volume. The gastric uh, volume is quite a bit higher than what's in the small bowel. So if you have a tube in the small bowel and it has a residual volume of 
five milliliters or less than five milliliters for a couple days, then all of a sudden it jumps up to 50 or 100. It's a pretty good indication the tube is uh, dislocated upward into the stomach, and that's the time when we get an x-ray. So we cut down the number of x-rays that way. And then even at the time of initial placement, we use pH to look at the uh, aspirate to tell where the tube's at. Very often when we insert a tube, we get into the stomach, pull the fluid back, get a low pH, and then manipulate the tube down into the small bowel. And when we get a pH of 7 or 8, then we're pretty sure we're in the small bowel. Then we get the x-ray. When a person aspirates, it's not just a, uh, a one-size-fits-all. A person can aspirate a lot of fluid versus just a small amount of fluid. In critical care settings, we look for micro-aspirations. You can't even see them when these people are in ventilators. But in nursing home patients who are dysphagic, uh, they're prone to vomiting, and if they're lying flat in bed, particularly on their back, and they have a big emesis, that can just go right down into the airway, and we call those large volume aspirations. And what the individual aspirates is important also. If it's pure gastric juice, that's a lot worse than if it's water, because gastric juice has a low pH and it can literally burn the lungs. Aspiration during feedings are usually fairly small amounts, unless it happens to be a chunk of meat or something that obstructs the airway and then we just see people hopefully coughing because that helps clear the airway and we see the hoarse voice or hear the hoarse voices and maybe gurgling in the throat. Then finally as I said the micro aspirations are hard to pick up and that's why when we tube feed people, in the past we used to add blue dye to the formula. And we would think, okay, here's this blue formula, and if I see blue formula in the mouth, or when I suction the lungs, if I see blue formula, I know they're aspirating. And in theory, that works, but it really doesn't work. So now, it's totally out of the tube feeding protocols. The glucose method, we used to think that there was no glucose in tracheal secretion, so that when you suction a patient, if we'd test for glucose and we saw it there, we thought, ah, this is glucose-rich formula. But that doesn't work either, because really the glucose gets into the tracheal secretions through the bloodstream. So that one's out of the picture. The bottom line is we can't really mark uh, aspiration unless uh, you're using a lab assay. And in my studies, I've used uh, a gastric enzyme. So we could tell when a patient's aspirating gastric juice, if I find the gastric enzyme pepsin mm -hmm. in their lung, then I know they've aspirated gastric contents. We've published that a number of times. It's a great test. It's a laboratory test, but it shows that people do aspirate, particularly on mechanical ventilation when they're being tube fed. Probably 89% of the patients at, here at the University Hospital we followed over a three-day period aspirated at least once. We talked some this morning about it's important when feeding a patient to set them up at 90 degrees or as high as they can. And even in the middle of the night when you're giving a person medications or something, it's still advisable to set them up so they're in an upright position when they're taking their medications. The standard guidelines are 45 degrees. 30 is the bare minimum. And in my study that was published in Critical Care Medicine, people less than 30 degrees aspirated more than those who were greater than 30 degrees. Those who were 45 degrees aspirated less than those that were 30 degrees. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to get nurses to elevate the head of the bed. And in uh, long-term care facilities, nurses are told, don't elevate the head of the bed because you'll cause sacral ulcers. So this is a fight we have. Mm -hmm. Those of us who are trying to prevent aspiration versus those who are trying to prevent bed sores. Are you saying that um, patients who are at risk of aspiration or who have dysphagia or a history of regurgitation, that their head of bed should be elevated at all times if, if tolerated? I think the answer to your question is at least for one or two hours after feeding. And if you can keep the head of the bed elevated longer, then I would kind of put on my other hat and worry about uh, s skin. Mm -hmm. uh, but at least I'd say one or two hours after uh, a tube feeding, if it's an intermittent feeding, if it's a continuous feeding, it's got to be up all the time. If they're eating, uh, if they're being hand-fed, then I'd say one or two hours after that and uh, 
then kind of play it by ear. And I would say to clinicians, treat everybody who's mechanically ventilated and tube fed at high risk for aspiration. And that doesn't make much sense if you stop and think about it because a mechanically ventilated patient has an endotracheal tube that's got a cuff on it. And that cuff is supposed to keep uh, any secretions from coming past the cuff. So if the person has dysphagia, or it should get caught above the cuff. But in reality, we know that it will prevent a large volume aspiration, but little amounts of fluid trickle by these all the time. Mm -hmm. And these are what we call these micro aspirations that are hard to pick up. So mechanically ventilated patients do aspirate. As I said in my study, 89% of them aspirate at least once over a three-day period. Part of it because these uh, individuals are very heavily sedated where they don't fight the ventilator, they don't have a cough reflex, all of these things are factors. So when we mechanically ventilate somebody, that doesn't mean they're not aspirating. In fact, they're probably more likely to. Mm -hmm. I would say to people caring for dysphagic tube-fed patients, treat them like they're at high risk for aspiration. And I would say that in an extended care facility, nasogastric tubes aren't used more than a couple weeks. And then if they've got to be in any longer than that, they would put in a PEG tube, a gastrostomy tube. And many people uh, erroneously believe that people don't aspirate when they have a gastrostomy tube. They do. They aspirate every bit as much from a gastrostomy tube as they do from a nasogastric tube. Some of the risk factors for aspiration are a decreased level of consciousness for whatever reason. People who are very dependent on others for care seem to aspirate more than others. Severity of illness, uh, COPD and congestive heart failure have been mentioned as risk factors for aspiration. And probably that's because a person is having so much trouble breathing that they're not paying as much attention to swallowing mm -hmm. as they should. I think there's a belief that if we put in a tube feeding, we're lessening that, dec that risk of aspiration. And I, that's not been shown to be true. That's a good point. I think when people put a feeding tube in, it's to try to get the nutrients into the patient. It's not going to reduce aspiration. It might reduce the uh, kind of aspiration rather than being solid foods. Now we've got liquid formula. I'd like to add two groups of patients that are also at risk of aspiration. I think the frail older adult, they're just weaker and their swallowing uh, muscles are also weaker, weaker, so they're at risk. But also the patient with dementia. Um, they just may not have the cognitive wherewithal, really, to um, process the whole swallowing, um, uh, chewing, and remembering how to swallow, and so they can have impairment um, for that reason. Jan, there were just a few more points I'd like to make. Uh, when the opportunity exists, we'd like to do continuous feedings versus bolus feedings, and uh, preferably continuous feedings with a, a pump feeding pump because then we can keep the amount of fluid that's in the stomach at any given point in time uh, relatively low as opposed to a bolus feeding. Bolus feeding should be reserved for people who don't have dysphagia. People who are dysphagic don't get good mouth care and food pockets in their, their mouth and plaque develops on their teeth and we really need to use toothbrush, mechanical force with a toothbrush several times a day because when the organisms get embedded in the plaque, then that's where uh, they get into trouble when they regurgitate or where they aspirate uh, oral pharyngeal secretions. Toothets are okay for moistening the mouth, but they don't get rid of plaque. So toothbrushing is good. Uh, there is a little evidence that chlorhexidine mouthwashes help in cardiac surgical uh, patients. We found a very uh, limited use there. Uh, we've talked uh, this morning about signs of um, swallowing problems, signs that a patient may be aspirating, including coughing, drooling, having a hoarse voice. But also, uh, it's recognized that a number of individuals can experience silent aspiration. By definition, silent means we don't see the signs. So what we have is an individual having these little micro aspirations that don't cause any clinical signs until they develop pneumonia. Uh, they can be individuals who they uh, come, present with multiple upper respiratory tract infections. They just keep getting a, you know, a respiratory tract infection over and mm -hmm. over. And what really may be going on is they may be aspirating, and that's going undetected. And that's the individual that needs the uh, uh, swallow uh, follow-up by a speech pathologist. I think it's sad that we have to get to that point before we get the speech pathologist involved.
I think many people should be uh, studied uh, for, worked up for dysphagia so this doesn't happen because there are feeding techniques we can use and the speech pathologist can tell us what they are. Some people need thickened liquids, some don't. Some do better with a chin down swallow, some don't. And if we know who those people are, we can prevent these silent aspirations or at least slow them down and cut down the rates of uh, pneumonia. Are there any practices that many nurses have learned that are no longer best practices, no longer recommended for nurses to use? There's one that really comes to mind, mm -hmm. and it's the insufflation of air through the feeding tube to tell where the tube's placed. And over the past, I'd say, 10 years, I've done research that's shown that this doesn't work. Unfortunately, what happens when a nurse uh, injects air through the feeding tube and listens over the epigastrium, they used to be taught that if you hear a gurgling sound, that means the tube's in the stomach. Unfortunately, if the tube's in the stomach, if it's in the lung, if it's in the small bowel, if it's in the esophagus, we even published an article in the American Journal of Nursing where a feeding tube was in the brain and the nurses heard this gurgling sound. Mm. So the bottom line is they should not do this. Dr. Muthini, I just want to tell you this is a wonderful try this tool that you've um, developed on preventing aspiration in older adults with dysphagia. I also think it's just terrific that a companion article to accompany this tool is going to be available in the American Journal of Nursing um, and also this video. So thank you for this wonderful work and My all pleasure. of your research. In addition to the um, Hartford webpage that has the try this and the companion article in the American Journal of Nursing, two other resources available to nurses to use to learn more about feeding um, special populations of patients. One of them is the Alzheimer's Association. It has um, some really good information on late stage dementia care and feeding patients and ethical issues that nurses and family members need to consider uh, when thinking about whether or not to place a feeding tube. In addition, the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Strokes has a lot of information on dysphagia and assessment of the patient with dysphagia that I highly recommend. I'm Marcia McGuire. I'm geriatric clinical nurse specialist on the ACE unit. I'm Heather. I am a student nurse. Hi everyone, I'm Jean Palmer. I'm a doctoral student and a um, nurse. Hi, I'm Janice Stevens. I'm a speech pathologist at St. Louis University Hospital. I'm Annie. I'm a Nine North RN Bohr nurse. And I'm Dottie. I'm a student nurse. Um, you mentioned earlier muscles with swelling. Can you tell me a little bit about the swelling process? I know I read there's like over 50 or about 50 muscles involved in the swelling process. So there, yeah, th there is. The sw swelling process actually is very complex, and um, and it takes place in the matter of you know one to two seconds. It's very very quick and very very prompt with a person who has normal muscles and there isn't an issue. Um, it, it's a very quick process. Um, Put a brain tumor or a you know stroke or Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or something into the mix and things go haywire. Um, but there are basically four uh, steps in swallowing, four stages in swallowing. The four stages of swallowing consist of the oral prep phase, which is where you take the food and you put it in your mouth and you start to manipulate it. Um, the second stage is the oral stage, which is where you pass the food from the front of your mouth to the back of your mouth and you start to get ready to actually swallow it. The third stage of swallowing is triggered when the food gets to the back of the tongue and you're at the level of the soft palate up at the top and then the, the food goes through the pharynx, goes through the pharynx. And the pharynx is basically a tube mm -hmm. that is like this. You've got two tubes that sit side by side um, about halfway down and, um, and then the, and when the swallow is actually triggered, when the food gets to the back of your back of your mouth and the swallow is triggered, your epiglottis kicks in and covers over the airway, okay, so that the food will go down the esophagus the way that it's supposed to go. Um, and we'll talk in a minute about the things that can go wrong that can cause that epiglottis not to close all the way. And this is the main area of concern when we're talking about dysphagia or swallowing issues is that your airway is sitting open and you've got a 50-50 shot of where the food is going to go. This is an issue. Um, so you need that epiglottis to be covering over the airway um, and the food goes down the right way. And then the fourth stage of swallowing is the esophageal stage. 
which is where the food goes from the pharynx down through the esophagus um, and, and then is, is digested. Can you explain how thickening helps the swallowing process? Sure. Um, we will use thickener if we have a patient who has a delay in their swallow. And the object is we want the liquid to slow down so that the patient has a safe swallow by the time they're ready to swallow. The, the liquid goes down so slow that by the time they kick the swallow in, they're actually ready to swallow. Um, and it'll go down safely. So the, the types of thickener, we use a gel-based thickener here, but there is um, powder-based thickeners that you can also get. But um, typically it comes in two, um, two levels. So you've got a nectar thickener, which is the smaller packet, um, and then a honey thickener, which is a little bit, you know, drips like honey would, so it's very slow. Um, you can also thicken liquids up to a pudding consistency um, for some patients if it means that they don't have to go with tube feeding. So can any nurse um, thicken a, a liquid if they feel like a patient needs it? Um, I um, Absolutely, the, the nurse can thicken the liquids. We actually recommend that they do so, um, and we will educate the nurses after we do our evaluation um, to let them know what is safe and what is not safe for this patient. Um, but for a nurse to, you know, get a new patient and say, oh my, I think, you know, let's put them on a honey thickened liquid without knowing what the rationale would be um, is not a good idea. We don't recommend that the doctors do it either. So when a patient enters the hospital with a diagnosis of stroke, here, they are not fed or given medication until the speech pathologist has done a screening to make sure that they can swallow okay. One of the things we're looking for, whether it's an Alzheimer's patient or a 16-year-old you know, trauma head injury patient, is um, whether or not they are spontaneously swallowing. And you can get some idea of what they're doing just by, um, you know, presenting a little bit of stimulation and, you know, and see what they're doing. If they are speaking at all, um, then you can listen to the voice. If the voice sounds very wet and, you know, goopy sounding, um, then that's a good sign that they're not swallowing their own saliva and it's not headed down the right way. So um, a, a wet and gurgly vocal quality is a very bad sign um, and it, it alerts us to the fact that there is an issue with the swallowing. What about, I know we're here at a university hospital setting, but what kind of pearls of wisdom would you give for nurses who are working in nursing homes or smaller mm -hmm. hospitals where they don't have a speech pathologist right there on right. staff, uh, as far as what kinds of red flags for them that they should watch for when mm -hmm. feeding a patient or caring mm -hmm. for a patient that are warning signs that the patient may be having aspirating? if the patient is coughing or choking when they're being fed, um, if they have a fever of unknown origin, always a red flag for aspiration pneumonia. You know, so you want to watch for those things. And then also to have a list of diagnoses that would be common um, to have difficulty with swallowing, such as stroke or brain tumor, uh, Parkinson's disease, um, Alzheimer's, of course, you know, things like that. So if you've got a patient who's had a stroke and they're droopy on one side, um, you're going to find pocketing in the mouth. Um, in some cases, and that is an indication of weak um, uh, muscles here on the side of the face and also could be an indication of weakness um, on the, this side of the tongue. Um, and what happens is they're chewing and they're chewing and they're just pocketing the food over here on the side. The issue with pocketing of the food is twofold. One, they're not getting the nutrition that they need if it's stuck in the mouth. And the biggest issue is the aspiration risk from pocketing food comes when you as a nurse lay the patient back down and they've got all this food. They lay down, <gasps> taking a big breath when they start to go to sleep and inhale it right into their lungs. Mm. And that's a big issue. You should always sit patients all the way upright. Never try to feed a patient, you know, in a reclined position. I know sometimes you go in and you feed, you know, you have to give the patient their medicine at two o'clock in the morning and you don't want to sit them up, but it is in the best, in the best interest of the patient. You know, the main emphasis, anytime you're talking about dysphagia or swallowing issues, um, what you're trying to prevent, two, two very important things, you're trying to prevent aspiration from occurring. Um, and that is mainly the role of the speech pathologist as far as swallowing goes, is to, is to prevent aspiration from occurring. Um, just as important is making sure that the patient is getting adequate nutrition.